<laughs> you know, in fact, I came to this because somebody Tom asked, asked me about what you know about particle annihilation, where you have two different particles that one get together and annihilate each other. So they have, there is a region with one particle, another with the other, and an interface where they, they change. Uh, another thing, for instance, another example is a harmonic map. You have a harmonic map whose image is just the lines, the accesses, right? So suppose you are in RN and you do a harmonic map, but you force the image, it has to be just, just the lines, right? And then the, the <coughs> in, in the base domains, the, the domain partitions into the points that go into each one of the lines, and again, there is some sort of interface among the, among the points that are decided to go to one place or another. So mathematically, it's rather similar. Um, some examples of price formation where are sellers and buyers, and there is some gap in between, between what one wants to get and what one wants to, to, um, um, to pay. Uh, in some sense, uh, problems like flame propagations are, are also of the same, of the same type. There is a, an ignition temperature, and when you are below the ignition temperature, you have uh, some gas flowing, and when you are above, it flows at a higher temperature, right? And so there is this transition surface where this takes place. Uh, in, uh, in, um, in there are problems in phase transitions, which are more complex, where the, you have the two phases of uh, some, some continuum, and uh, then uh, the, <laughs> there is this change of phase uh, interface, and there there are problems which are also of the same type, but a little bit more complex, because for instance, in many of these problems, there is also a surface energy, and so what you have is not only a diffusion on one side and a diffusion on the other, but also there is the, the, <coughs> the surface energy that links then the, the curvature of the surface to the densities on both sides. So, so there is also those type of problems. I'm not going to talk about it like that. Uh, <coughs> basically, uh, there are, uh, so there are, when you treat that, I think the, the, the flame propagation problem is a good example of what are the, the, what are the approach to this problem. Uh, uh, you have the <coughs> flame propagation, you have um, the, area where the temperature is bigger than ignition, and there you have a diffusion process, Laplacian or something like that, the area where it is smaller, and then you have to decide what happens in between. And so there is sort of one, what we call the, the soft model, right, or the where it is assumed that the flame has some width. And so mathematically, that means that there is some sort of a smooth passage from one phase to the other, okay? And then you can uh, do the sort of uh, <coughs> high limit approximation where you reduce the, the ignition at just the surface of ignition. And then that means that there, there is some sort of discontinuity on the derivatives of the surface, okay? And so uh, the, the, when you study the problems, is you have, you start to looking at it the, to find existence of this problem, the easiest thing to do, or the, the best approach, is to consider the soft problem, where the, <laughs> the, the, the temperature, the, the flame uh, uh, covers a, a, a strip, and therefore the equation is not so dramatic. It's like a heat equation equal to some uh, uh, right-hand side, which is bounded, uh, uh, which um, the term is that you put in the, in the ignition temperature. Uh, when you want to study the geometry of the limit, then you have to, to, have to make the, the width smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And so the, the ignition concentrates just on the surface, and that becomes a three boundary problem. And so for existence and regularity, it's worse, but for the geometric description of what happens is better because it's a neat uh, transition, okay? And so, so we will see a little bit of that phenomenon here. So basically what I, <coughs> you know, there is a lot of <coughs> literature, so what I wanted to <coughs> sort of concentrate is to 
uh, discuss uh, several different types of interactions. In other words, I'm going to talk a little bit at the basic problem where you have sort of uh, um, uh, um, the two regions, right? Uh, a region where there is <laughs> the um, 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 one, one, uh, one type and the region where there is the other type and the separation surface, okay? And there we will have harmonic functions in both sides and a phase transition. Uh, then, uh, so another interesting type that uh, we have been studying is when the segregation makes a jump, in other words, where <laughs> you, there is a gap between the two species, okay? And uh, this is, uh, uh, when we thought about doing this, I looked a little bit at the literature and there are some very uh, interesting uh, uh, examples. For instance, uh, there is one where, you know, <laughs> they, there is a, uh, ants are very aggressive, and so when there is a dense population, when there is a, a not big population of the ant, ants, then they are more or less separated in groups uh, without too much organization. But when there is a, 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 a high percentage, high density of ants, then they group their net group in hexagon, and so there they form hexagons which are all separated by a strip of, uh, of constant width. And, and we, I'm going to talk about some math we did about that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, <coughs> also describe a little bit when, when the media, uh, the, the diffusion is uh, given by fully nonlinear equations, as optimal control problems, and then, 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 then I will talk a little bit more mathematics on that. And also when one of the, <laughs> one of the species it so moves uh, infinitesimally, it's a local, you know, Laplacian type uh, diffusion, and the other species uh, instead can travel at a distance, can do uh, jump processes. So how, how they interact, because I think it's an interesting uh, difference between the, the models, okay? So let me uh, start just giving uh, a little background, so basically, as I said, this is what I mentioned before about the, the, case, the case of, the, of the, flame the flame propagation, right? Is, uh, there is, in principle, uh, we will look at, um, at two species that are two means that diffuse in some sense, right? And in their consistency is penalized. In other words, when they are together, then they have sort of the, to pay the, the, the density of population for both decreases. And this is like the smooth problem, right? And then you, if you increase the penalization, in other words, you make the penalization sort of go to infinity, then the species completely separates. And then we, what is interesting there is to, under, to see what is the stability, the geometry of the interface. Okay. Um, so let me give you this super baby problem to see what it's about, right? And then because. And so the super baby problem is the following, is, is you, you have, a, let's say you have a species U, a U and V, right? And they diffuse according to sort of the one dimensional Laplacian, UXX. Uh, but when they are together, when their density is, is uh, <laughs> when, the, when their density is, uh, when they overlap, right? then they, you have to pay a lot. In other words, the function becomes very convex, con, con, uh, convex okay? And so for every epsilon, basically in this problem, everything is very simple because the difference, oops, okay, the difference uh, uh, satisfies is, is, a little, is a line, right? So the difference is a line and uh, so the solution u epsilon is, the solutions are always positive because you have data positive and you know, this right hand side will become negative if you have negative, so they force the solution to be positive and then as epsilon goes to zero, this approximates more and more these uh, two lines. So in the limit, uh, u infinity or u zero, let's say, will be positive here and zero here and v will be positive here and zero here. Mm. So this is basically, this is the simplest model, the first uh, model I, uh, <laughs> I said I wanted to discuss. Uh, so let me, for those that are, uh, you know, probably there are not many in the audience, but just for, for, 
for, uh, for those that are not uh, so much in analysis. Let me tell you why, when I say diffusion, 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 what do I mean by diffusion, okay? And so I'm going, in this lecture, I'm just going to use, apart from fully nonlinear equation, I'm going to use uh, Laplacian and some fractional Laplacian, okay? And so let me tell you what the fractional Laplacian is. The fractional Laplacian is, uh, <laughs> so is this formula, okay? I'm interested in the Laplacian to the one half, which is when S is one half, so here is N plus one. And so basically, why is this a diffusion? What, is it, what do I mean by a diffusion process? It means that a, 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 an integral like that basically represents a, a gain loss of operator. In other words, I'm in the position X, right? And there is a particle as a diffusion, as a distribution of particles, U of Y everywhere, right? And then there are the particles are jumping. So there are the particles that jump into my position and there are particles that leave my position. And so if I want to know what is the balance of particles at my position, right? Then I have to, this integral accounts for <laughs> the particles which are in the position y and are jumping into x, and the density of jump is given by this kernel. In other words, the positions which are far away, there are less particles jumping into my position. And as they get closer, there are more particles, right? And they are, these are the ones that are going away. And basically, the Laplacian is a limit configuration of that. In fact, you know, when you look at the Laplacian, it's uxx plus uyy plus ucc, <laughs> you know, why is this particular, why is this a special function, right, special equation. But really, you can think of the Laplacian as the limit of the average. I'm, again, yes, I'm in the position x, and I'm surrounded now in a little ball by the densities uy, right? And if I take this average and I divide by the, <coughs> I have, well, here I have uh, the volume of the ball plus two, it has to be, a, 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 it's n plus two, the radius of the ball to the n plus two because it's second derivative, right? So, so if you look at that limit here, it has to be one over epsilon to the n plus two, then that limit con converges to the Laplacian when epsilon goes to zero, okay? And I think this clarifies, at least I find it is clarifying when you look at the heat equation, right? It says ut equal Laplacian of u, why is this is a heat equation special? because the heat equation is basically saying, I am standing at this position, I am being surrounded by these particles, okay? And if the average of what surrounds us is bigger than my density, right, then I'm going to grow, right? The UT says if the Laplacian is positive, that is if there are, the, there are particles coming in more than the ones that are going on, then the function grows, and if, uh, if, uh, if uh, quantity, the density at my point is bigger, the function decreases. In other words, I'm trying sort of to revert to my surrounding averages, okay? And that's why the heat, if you take the heat equation and put some initial data, which is oscillatory, that immediately kills the oscillations and tries to smooth everything, okay? And so this is, <laughs> so this in some sense is what will justify how things happen later, okay? Uh, Another thing that I will be needing later, I will need to use uh, is the following, is that the half Laplacian, right, this is what I said, the half Laplacian also can be uh, represented uh, in the following way, so I'm in the, in the phase X of dimension N, right, and then I can write the half Laplacian just in, in that space, right, which is this formula. But another way to, to look at it is the following, is I'm in the space X and I'm going to extend my function to one more variable Y by solving the Dirichlet problem. In other words, by showing, extending to the harmonic function in one more dimensions. And if you do that and you take the normal derivative, you, you can use the Poisson kernel to compute the normal derivative and you realize that the half Laplacian of U is exactly the same as the normal derivative of u in this extension, okay? And this is very useful because it, in some sense, reduces a non-local problem to a local one. In other words, it allows you to use many uh, classical formulas of uh, the Laplacian, right, uh, <laughs> applied to this extension. So this I'm going to do later, sooner or later. Okay, so, so basically now, so basically, uh, 
uh, the, the segregation problem that we are going to look will, will be the generalization of 1D, right? We have uh, several different species, right? And they, uh, in some sense, diffuses among them, and they are penalized for being together. And so basically, in general, will be the problems of the form, uh, some operator, diffusion operator on UJ, equal to one over epsilon, which is the penalization times UJ times some function that might be local or non-local of, uh, of the other component, okay? So in the, in the example I gave before, then Fi of UI was simply UI, okay? So, uh, so the UIs, right, are the FR positive, so the UJs are all subsolutions of a diffusion equation, and therefore they are automatically bounded by the boundary data, right? You know, if you have a subsolution of an elliptic equation, uh, in general, the boundary data bounds the interior, so my functions are all going to be bounded, no problem. And uh, since the right-hand side change signs when you try to put negative values, then the solutions will be all non-negative. So basically, uh, uh, the solutions, uh, so the solutions of these equations in general will be all non-negative and, uh, <coughs> and bounded above. Uh, and as epsilon, as long as epsilon is uh, mm, not zero, right? then it is usually rather standard to find solutions of this equation. You know, there is elliptic equations, a nice right-hand side. You can ap apply many, many different uh, techniques. Uh, 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 in the problems I discussed at the beginning, some, some solutions are, uh, the operators are of divergence form, where you know, the Laplacian equation, right, is an equation which is divergence and non-divergence, right? You can write it as divergence of gradient of u, or you can write it as aij, dij of u. And sort of, especially for these problems, they are very different, the, the two approaches. Uh, sort of the general philosophy I have is that to study sort of initial existence of regularity, energy methods are the, are sort of, um, the best ones, right, and, and, and so you can easily find the existence of solutions that maybe are held are continuous and so on. When you look at hi higher regularity, then the non-divergence approach is, uh, is really the one that really uh, tells you what happens. And in a divergence, if you have a divergence equations, divergence of Aij of x, gradient u, and AIJ is held or continuous, you cannot show me a single solution. <laughs> While if you tell me AIJ, DIJ of U equal to zero, then you can show some super solutions and sub solutions, complex functions are solutions, and so on. Uh, so and, uh, <laughs> the techniques are different for different problems. This is a, should hurry up a little bit. Um, so there, there has been a lot of work in, this, in the first model I discussed. Uh, um, so the main results that we obtained, we actually did some work, with, we consider our work with Pang Walling, and it's uh, a smoothness of solutions and a smoothness and the geometry of interface. So let me tell you more or less what, how it works. So basically, we, I'm talking now about the same problem I did first with one variable, in other words, I have Laplacian of uj equal to one over epsilon. I think I wrote it before. Oops, I didn't write it before. Okay, sorry. I have to put things together. <laughs> I was not planning to use any things, so I put together things. Uh, basically, the equation that, uh, that I, I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, this basically the equation uh, 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 we study was uh, Laplacian of UI equal to the sum of UI UJ over epsilon. Um, so that's the sort of the simplest, it's non-divergence form, and it's not hard to find solutions. Uh, the question is then when you want to look at the geometry of the solutions. And so let me tell you what, uh, where are the difficulties we found and that we have to solve. Uh, so you have several components now, right? 
And if you have only two components, then you are basically in the one dimensional case. In other words, you take one minus the other, and then you just said the UI UJ cancels, the UI UKs are different. Let me write, write them. So basically, the problem we studied there was Laplacian of UJ is the simplest ones equal to sum of UJ, UK, K different than uh, J, right, divided by epsilon. And so when epsilon goes to zero, that forces all of the population to segregate, okay? Now, <coughs> if you have only two of them to get, coming together, there is no one else, right? then we are in the case of the two-dimensional case, right? In other words, you take the difference and you have Laplacian of U1 minus U2, let's say, is equal to zero. So this is a harmonic function, right? Independently of epsilon, it's the same harmonic function. And you let epsilon go to zero, and then you have that both are the positive and negative part minus the negative part of the, of the domain. So basically, <laughs> what you have there is you have a harmonic function and the phase transition is a, harm, is a, is a level surface of a harmonic function, so it's, it's everything fine. So there, what there is to prove? Well, the problem is that when you have more than one, then it's very uh, diff difficult to... Uh, <coughs> it's not coming back. Right, so, so basically, <coughs> uh, there, there are, and, and several comes together, you have to decide what happens, right? And so maybe that several comes together and some of them are very skinny, or the several comes together and they have uh, some positive density going into a point. So if they are very skinny, you don't want that. And so you have to, we have to prove that there is not such a thing, that if one of the components is very narrow at some scale, then you can start entering dyadically and you kill it after a finite number of steps. So that means that this configuration does not happen and then, uh, if that configuration happens, then, so, so now we know that we have sort of several, if you have more than one component, you can have several, but they keep some positive density. And so you can, what you can prove is that basically you can separate them in, in, uh, neatly, uh, and so you have that uh, uh, transition uh, be, between these functions, and so this and this now become harmonic transitions, so they are regular, and then, where you have a triple or multiple point, and we use there a sort of a, some algorithm monotonicity formulas for multiple value functions that basically allow you to show that asymptotically the, <laughs> the components are like homogeneous of the same homogeneity. So it's basically like a, <laughs> like, a, a, like a conical configuration and everything is regular. So this was the... the the, the regularity theory for, for this problem. So one that uh, was more interesting that we started, I did with uh, um, Stefania Patricia and Veronica Quitalo uh, was uh, what happens if there is a gap, as is in the example of the ants, right? I mean, what, what, so how do you model the existence of a gap? So, you know, it's, uh, the existence of a gap appears uh, if you, uh, for instance, <laughs> A, a, a penalization like this, right? You have, uh, so, so basically you have uh, the Laplacian of UJ is one over epsilon UJ times, and then this penalization term is non-local. For instance, you can put the integral on the ball of radius R centered at a point, okay? So if I do that and I let epsilon goes to zero, then this quantity has to go, you know, then uh, UJ and uh, and UI have to be, uh, uh, um, one of them has to be zero uh, when this quantity is going to infinity, okay? And that means that the sort of the, the free boundary for UJ has to stay at distance at least uh, R from the free boundary of uh, UK, okay? So basically, so this is like the example of the, of the ants, and in fact there are, there are a lot of examples in the uh, segregation literature about that. You know, it's just like uh, uh, muscles, uh, a group like a group like that in the beach, and uh, <coughs> and owls have some way of screaming to keep in away the other species. 
So, so basically, uh, let me tell you the, so this is the mathematical theory here, that we, go, we basically show then that we have um, a little bit like the picture uh, I, I showed before, that we end up having these uh, smooth uh, channels in n dimensions where the, the surfaces are uh, C1 alpha and are exactly at distance one from each other all the time, right? And then there are some triple points where uh, <laughs> the, the, the surface, the, the um, one species, oops, where the interaction is changed from, from one species to another, okay? And we deduce a, a free boundary condition. Okay, we, we study the problem. Uh, we study the problem for p equal one and infinity. For p equal to intermediate, we just show existence and so on. But for the geometry of interfaces, we pick one and infinity. And in the case of infinity, which is the one which we know more when more carefully, then you have an interface condition that says that the ratio between the normal vector at opposite points, each point has a unique opposite point, and the ratio between the normal vectors is proportional to the Gauss curvatures, the, prof the product of the curvatures of the interface in each side. In other words, if you have like a ring, you know, if you have a configuration which is like a, the one species which is a circle and then the other one which is a larger circle, parallel circle, right? Then the normal derivative, in other words, the species which is more uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a, which is whose, whose uh, habitat is, is, uh, is concave needs to put a higher normal derivative than the opposite one to, to, to sort of resist there. Okay. So now, so now I want to discuss uh, these two problems, the non-local, non-local, and the, this I want to discuss a little bit more in detail and give you some, some of the mathematics, okay? So basically, the, so the, the, the question we wanted to look at here, then it is like the, the first species, right? In other words, you have before, have Laplacian, Laplacian, but the issue is if one of the species has uh, you know, it has a jump process. It, you know, it could be a, a flying insect or it could be as, a, as plants that are carried by the wind. So you have uh, these two. And then the first question you ask is, okay, well, what, what do you expect, right? You know, what, what do you expect to happen? Uh, so we write again the basic, uh, uh, <laughs> the basic uh, uh, penalization method, right? Uh, I'm going to discuss it is, pretty much with every S, but I'm just going to discuss the one half, which is easier to discuss, okay? So basically, uh, we have this, and again, when if you take the difference, then you have this uh, relation that has Laplacian of U epsilon minus Laplacian to the S of V epsilon has to be equal to zero, okay? <laughs> and so when you let epsilon go to zero, then you ask what happens, okay? So basically, what happens when epsilon goes to zero is that the two, again, as usual, the two uh, species are going to be disjoint. So you have u1, u in one side, and v on the other, okay? Uh, in the part where u is equal to zero, the Laplacian of u is equal to zero, right? There is nothing to, to say, okay? Now, <laughs> but uh, if you have a fractional operator, the Laplace, the operator in the set where the function is zero is not zero anymore. In other words, if you do, uh, I don't know if I wrote this, yeah. Okay, uh, so you expect again adjacent support, right? Uh, <coughs> but uh, if you do, but now, now we, we said, okay, uh, <coughs> in the region where uh, Laplacian of so, uh, in the region where Laplacian of, uh, of uh, where u is uh, bigger than zero, right, we have, <coughs> in, uh, in the, um, I'm sorry, in the part where, yeah, when we are in the interior of place where u is equal to zero and v is bigger than zero, Laplacian of u is equal to zero because u is equal to zero forces is infinitesimal, the Laplacian of u is equal to zero, right? And Laplacian of V is equal to zero <coughs> because Laplacian of V minus fractional Laplacian of, of U has to be equal to zero. So in that region, everything is as usual. 
But when you look at the region where, uh, La, where U is positive, where, where V is zero, Laplacian uh, uh, S of V is not zero. And let me, so let me. Okay. Right. <laughs> In other words, <coughs> Uh, so, uh, suppose that you are looking at a uh, uh, solution, so you have Laplacian uh, to the one half, let's say, or to the S of V, right, equal to zero in this region, okay? So V is some positive function, right, is equal to zero, and because here to zero. Then what is the Laplacian of, of uh, the fractional Laplacian of V here? Well, you know, I have to do the integral of V of Y minus V of x0, this is x0, over uh, y minus x0 to the n plus 2s, right? But, you know, this integral is always positive. Because, you know, here is 0, this integral, and here is strictly positive. So, in fact, if you have a, a, a Laplacian of V equal to 0 and just in one dimension in this direction, then here V is like <laughs> uh, x to <coughs> the uh, to the s, that is the power of the Laplacian, and here v is and the Laplacian here of v here, the Laplacian to the s of v here is zero, but here v is zero and the Laplacian to the s of v is equal to one over uh, the distance here to the s. In other words, the uh, the, the, you cannot just, uh, now it's not again the same, ga uh, the same game as before. So basically, uh, <laughs> so basically we realize first that the Laplacian of UDR is not zero anymore, so the problem is not that easy as you thought. And then the other thing is that uh, fractional Laplacians cannot carry uh, mass in a surface. You know, the Laplacian can be a distribution on a surface, right? If you take the function uh, absolute value of x, right, then the Laplacian is zero on one side, zero on the other, and it's a delta at the point, right? In other words, the first derivative of absolute value is the jump, and the second derivative is the delta, okay? So in the, in the previous problems that we look, which we are just infinitesimal, the interface always carried a, a, a measure, okay? Here, the Laplacian to the S of V cannot carry a measure there. And therefore, the formula that says Laplacian of U minus Laplacian to the S of V equal to zero says that the Laplacian of U cannot carry a density there, okay? So your solution has to be, for you, <laughs> what you have to solve is that Laplacian of U is equal to Laplacian of S of V when in the re which is bigger than zero on the region where u is bigger than zero on the left in this picture, right? But also has to come tangentially all along the interface to zero, okay? And so this is a much more delicate problem than the previous ones. Uh, <laughs> so, so basically what we, the way we did this is work I, I did with Patrici. The, what we did then is to use a subsolution approach, okay? So what is a subsolution? A subsolution, you want to have, uh, basically, you want to have a subsolution. Uh, so a subsolution will be, you, you have prescribed U and V, the right data on the boundary, and what you want is Laplacian of U minus Laplacian of V, which is what in the limit is supposed to be zero, to be bigger or equal than zero, okay? So what does that mean geometrically? Geometrically means <coughs> that uh, here you have, you know, you, you have, let's say, uh, uh, what you expect, and so what you have uh, is uh, in the, for the subsolutions, you have that, uh, okay, V, you can make it a solution, and U is zero, and they are, you split U, you can split U in two parts. One is the harmonic parts that come from the boundary, and the other is the part that carries the right-hand side, okay? And then, for, to have a subsolution, the 
sort of the sum of both has to still remain positive. In other words, the part that carries the right-hand side has to stay below the harmonic function. Okay, and then we, what you expect is when you take the largest subsolution is that ut becomes tangent to u2 becomes tangent to u1 all along the boundary. Okay, and so let me uh, <coughs> give you some ideas how you prove it. So uh, you we started to have some you know, started with more or less uh, a simpler configuration, which is uh, our domain is going to be a Lipschitz strip. Okay, so an infinite Lipschitz strip, and so here, uh, uh, oops, so, <laughs> okay, so here, uh, on the right, we have uh, V equal to one and U equal to zero, on the left, V equal to zero, U equal to one, right, <laughs> and then, uh, we, we, um, we, in, uh, we, uh, we have our subsolutions and in the limit we expect a subsolution, okay? So basically, uh, the first thing I, uh, I of good about this configuration is that uh, if these things are Lipschitz graph, then that forces the free boundary to be Lipschitz graph. And the reason is the following, so suppose you have a subsolution and you move it a little bit to the, if you move it a little bit down, but if you take your subsolution and slide it all a little bit down, then here u was positive before, u became one before and was less than one. Now u become one a little bit behind. And here v1 becomes one a little bit ahead, okay? And so this is, <coughs> if the previous was a subsolution, this is a still a subsolution because it still has the condition on the jump over here, but it's smaller than the other one, it's smaller than one here and bigger than one here, okay? So if I slide this a little bit back, that is still a subsolution and should be below my largest subsolution, which is my solution. But since the function is Lipschitz, then I have room to move it a little bit right and left, right? In other words, I move it down, so it's just at this down at distance h from the boundary, if I move it a little bit right and less, it still stays below the boundary here, above the boundary here. Okay, so that's again a subsolution. In other words, when I take the soup of all subsolutions, then I can, I can take any subsolution and then I can slide it down and move it and that also qualifies as a subsolution, okay? What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that the limiting solution, the interface, is Lipschitz, okay, because for if, if I have something which is too steep, uh, like this way, when I move it a little bit, it's gonna cross the limiting, uh, least, sub, the largest subsolution, okay? So Lipschitz regularity, the Lipschitz properties of this forces the interface to be uh, Lipschitz in the limit, okay? Now we want to prove that indeed the limit, that is the largest subsolution, uh, all the, the normal derivative uh, uh, <coughs> becomes zero, in other words, that that for the largest absolution, you manages to become tangentially to zero at every point of the free boundary. That is, uh, up to now, it just was non-negative, so it begins maybe with some normal derivative. And this is achieved <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, so, so this is achieved uh, by several, we need several observations. Uh, the first one is that, <coughs> again, because of the translation argument, u minus v, that is if I have u and I stick to it the v, which is minus v, which is negative on the other side, that is monotone decreasing, right? Because of the uh, argument of translating the subsolution. Can it's monotone decreasing on, a, 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 on a, a whole family of directions, okay? <coughs> Um, so, so we want to, to show that in the limit, uh, um, what happens in the limit and the regularity of the free boundary, then now at this point, I want to cross to the extension configuration, right? In other words, I was saying I have Laplacian of V, Laplacian of U on one side, and Laplacian 
to the one half of V on the other, okay? And I just talk about operator. But now I want to identify Laplacian to the one half of V with its extensions in a half a space, okay? So basically now what we have is we have, uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, so uh, now I need a couple of technical things. Uh, um, uh, let, me, let me quote several theorems that I need to prove the regularity of the solution and the free boundary. The first one is the uh, boundary Harnack inequality. If you have equations that you have, oops, if you have equations that satisfy uh, functions u and v that satisfies the same equation, okay, uh, the same equation vanishes in a half a space. Uh, so in this half a space, u and v are positive, satisfy the same equation, are not negative, and vanish simultaneously here. Then the quotient of those two functions is held there continuous all the way to the boundary. No matter that, in principle, if you go inside, you know, this is equations which are only bounded measurable coefficients, so it would be uh, pretty bad. But as you go to the boundary, the quotient becomes held there continuous, okay? Now, uh, here I put a hyperplane, but really, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, the equations A, I, J, which are only um, uh, elliptic discontinuous, are invariant under uh, bilinear transformations. In other words, if you make a bilinear transformations, the A, I, J becomes M transpose times A, I, J times M, where M is the matrix of the bilinear transformation. So it's another matrix, which is again positive, so on. So, so the boundary Harnack is in, invariant under bilinear transformations, okay? Now, uh, so, <coughs> so that means that if I take any Lipschitz, if I take any Lipschitz domain, then the function here, the two functions here uh, are again, that, van, uh, that vanishes on this boundary, are again held or continuous up to this boundary, okay? Because I reduce the problem to the line. And if I have, a function, two functions which are harmonic, that, that satisfies that equation around a flat piece of surface, which is a Lipschitz domain. Also, the boundary Harnack holds because I can transform this domain into this by a bilinear transformation. And then I can append the domain, I can rotate, you know, this, this flat thing, let's say, is in this direction, and then I can rotate it to the right and to the left. In other words, my domain was the complement of, of a surface, and I open it like that, and that opening is also a bilinear transformation, okay? So the boundary Harnack theorem holds for any, any uh, artifact like that, okay? So what, what is that good for us? So now let me describe the problem I was describing up to now. Let me describe it using the extension theorem, okay? So using the extension theorem, what we have is, when I started, I had U and V that they both live along this line, which is an Rn, okay? And I have extended, uh, uh, and here along this line, V satisfies Laplacian, fractional Laplacian of V equal to something, right? Zero here, positive here. So now I do the extension, the symmetric extension, so U still lives here because the equation of U is here and Laplacian is here, I don't have to touch it. But now, if I do this extension, the fractional Laplacian of V, which is convolving with this kernel, becomes V nu, becomes, you know, it, it's, it's not an integral thing anymore. It's a value at the point, okay? So basically, <laughs> the equation now becomes V nu is equal to zero here, and V nu, which is a fractional Laplacian of V, is equal to the Laplacian of U here. In other words, in some sense, you have, you have this surface, you solve for V, right? And then, the, you, when you solve for V, the V nu gives you what the Laplacian of U should be. And then you build Laplacian of U just by, with that data. You have boundary data, and you build the Laplacian of U, okay? So, now, what is good about that? So, basically, uh, in this region, right, in this region, uh, V is a harmonic function, non-negative, and therefore satisfies the Harnack inequality that says that the value in all of this horseshoe is bounded above and below by the value here. 
And now it says, okay, I have, now I have V here. This is very, I enter into a distance. I, I go away from the boundary, from the free boundary, a distance proportional to this distance. And then v here V is harmonic, right? And is of order, uh, some order here. Then it is of, <coughs> V nu is F of an order less, that is, if, the, if, if here V is like D, here is V like D, right? And I'm at distance D, I have a distance, so D from the, uh, that some distance from the free boundary, then here should be, I'm sorry, D to, yeah, this, this is the distance, but D is like, I write this V to the alpha for some alpha, okay, which I want to prescribe later. So V is like D to the alpha here, is like D to the alpha here, the derivative is like D to the alpha minus one. Okay, so the, but then this is Laplacian of U. So Laplacian of U is like D to the alpha minus one, right? Which means that the function basically is two times better. So the function is like D to the alpha minus one plus two, right? So the function is, the function U is C1 alpha, okay? So we have C1 alpha regularity let me ask, tell you what is this alpha. This alpha, in principle, is, uh, can change from point to point, but it's some number between, a uh, strict number between zero and one, okay? And this is because our surface is lip, it's, it's lip cheese, right? And uh, we prove in some other work I did with, with uh, Rosatong and Serra, we prove uh, a sort of a fragment Lindelof theorems for fractional operators. In other words, if you have a fractional operator defined in the complement of a cone up to infinity, right, is like an homogeneous function, r to the alpha f of theta. Okay, and the homogeneity for the fractional operators is between uh, something zero and one. Okay, so, so the fact that the domain is Lipschitz allow us to uh, decide that the uh, function, that V has some uh, Helder uh, decay all over, and it tells us the fractional Laplacian of U, then it tells you that in principle U should be C1 uh, uh, plus uh, uh, D, to the, D to the alpha plus, uh, D, D to, like D to the alpha plus one, in other words, to separate like that. Of course, all of this is, if we prove that indeed u nu is zero along the boundary, because if not, the linearity will, will beat this quantity, right? It will be this plus something linear, okay? So to beat uh, the nonlinearity, we use uh, uh, two important properties of harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains, uh, okay? I'm just finishing here, to do two important files properties of harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains, right? The first one is that, <coughs> um, uh, uh, the first one is that uh, the normal derivative is in L2. Uh, this is, uh, 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 this was proven by Dolbert in the, in the 70s in some, some sort of more complex way but it's a relatively, you, you can really prove it very simply because you take u, so you have a Lipschitz domain and you have a harmonic function here and then you take u and u and this direction is e and you take u and u e and you write the standard formula, Laplacian u, u e minus u e Laplacian u in the domain is equal to u nu u e minus, I'm sorry, this is Laplacian of u e, uh, minus u, uh, u e nu. This is zero because this is zero, this is zero because everything is harmonic. There is some part of this which is far away, right? And so this is equal to the part which is far away over here, right? But since the domain is Lipschitz, the normal derivative always form an angle less than 90 degrees with UE. So U nu UE is like U nu square or UE square, comparable to both. Okay, and so <coughs> basically to prove that U nu is zero, U nu is an L2 function, so you have to prove that it is zero almost, uh, which is zero almost everywhere. 
Okay, and so you have to take a point on the boundary where you knew it's a point of differentiability for you knew. And then if the function uh, hits at an angle, you can make a small perturbation, move it a little bit forward and find a better subsolution. Okay, so that is the way we prove that the solution is C1 alpha. So this is basically the theory for the uh, local, non-local, and let me just go, <laughs> I still have a bunch of pages, but let me just look. They talk a little bit of, at the, um, the case where the segregation corresponds to fully nonlinear equations, to optimal equations and optimal control. <laughs> um, so optimal control sort of it means that it's, it's more adapted to financial mass than to a species, but it basically uh, is a, a nonlinear diffusion problem, right? That is a, the, the diffusion process that uh, minimizes diffusion among a family of equation operators, right? So basically, the typical limital control is the following, right? You say you, <coughs> uh, you are allowed, suppose, I, suppose I'm, uh, I'm standing here, right? And I want to do a random walk uh, uh, and want to decide what is the probability I hit the door before the wall, okay? Then, uh, if I'm, if I'm moving according to making a little circle around me, if I move at a point around a little circle around me, right, that is the Laplacian, the solution, uh, the, the, the expectation of going through the door is going to be the harmonic function, which is zero on the walls, because if you are by the wall, you more probably hit the wall. It's gonna be one at the door, because if you are just by the door, most probably you are going to go out. And in between, right, the probability of hitting the wall at this point, if I'm going to move in a little circle, is equal to the average on the little circle, right? But this was the Laplacian from the beginning. The Laplacian is the, <coughs> right, so this is Laplacian equal to zero, okay? So if I move in a little circle, right, then the expectation of leaving the, to the, through the door would be the solution to that problem. Okay, now suppose that you allow me to choose my random walk, right, point by point, right, in our words, and you, allow, and you allow me to choose an ellipsoid, in our words, okay, I'm going to move, jump into an ellipsoid, right, that is, has some bounded eccentricity, okay, and so I can point my ellipsoids to try to minimize or maximize my probability of going through the door, okay? So basically then, <coughs> since I can choose one at this point, what I want to find is the operator, right, that is basically <coughs> will be <coughs> the infimum of aij of x, dij of u equal to x at this point, right, uh, point by point among the family of all admissible matrices aij, right? And so to control the eccentricity is to basically say that aij will be, oops, that AIJ is going to be, <coughs> we can jump a lot. Yeah, it's going to be between two, the two multiples of the identity, that is two multiples of the Laplacian, okay? Now, <coughs> the solution of that equation, which is, looks completely wild, right, is a solution of a fully nonlinear equation. And there is this beautiful theory done by Krilov, Safanov, and Evans, that says that such, solu that such a solu uh, solution of such operator exists and is a C2 alpha function, right? And then you can get more higher regularity. <coughs> so, so, um, so basically the problem that, that uh, Veronica did uh, the study was you have a uh, <coughs> two species, and each one of them minimizes his diffusion property, so this, you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so has the, uh, op, uh, the um, satisfies the, the fully nonlinear equations, okay, and, um, <coughs> uh, and, and so, so they are managed to be disjoint, they don't segregate. Okay, they segregate, okay? So let me tell you uh, what that, that problem, in fact, the, that operator, let me, do I have about five minutes, more or less? Okay, so 
<laughs> Let me tell you, so that operator, uh, basically, it has, you can really give a formula for u, although it's a little bit wild formula. You take u, you have to take all the eigenvalues, you multiply the positive eigenvalues of the square of u by little lambda, right? The negative by capital lambda, right? <coughs> uh, uh, the positive by little lambda, the by capital lambda, and if you find a function that satisfies this equation at every point, that's the solution of f of d squared of u. Okay, so it is, as I said, it's remarkable that such a solution exists and it's so smooth. Okay, so basically, uh, <coughs> Veronica put through the existence of uh, holder solutions, right? You have the two disjoint domain, and each one they satisfy this uh, <coughs> equation. Uh, she proved that the solutions are in fact Lipschitz continuous across the interface. Inside they are C to alpha because they are solutions of a fully nonlinear equation, <coughs> and they are smooth above outside. Okay, and uh, with uh, Veronica, Monica Torres, and, uh, <coughs> and Patrici, we look at the regularity of the interface and the regularity of the solution and the interface where you change from one to the other. And uh, basically, uh <coughs> so basically, um, we prove regularity, C1 alpha regularity in the interface, and um, that involves a bunch of steps, which I'm not going to enter through because it's like 10 pages. Uh, but basically, let me see if I can catch the first thing. Okay, we have the usual equation, right? F of one minus F of the other equal to zero, okay? Uh, <coughs> uh, then uh, you can prove that the solutions are Lipschitz. This is what Veronica proved, the solutions are Lipschitz. And then the next thing we want to prove, that we can prove is that not only they are Lipschitz, but they have the same uh, slope. So basically, <coughs> if, uh, uh, if it's non-trivial, if, if we have a tangent plane, then it will be uh, the same for both, okay? And so the fact that they have the tangent plane from both sides comes from a monotonicity formula. So the yeah, is monotonicity formula for subharmonic functions that I wrote with, Avner, with Friedman and Alt years ago that says that if you have two subharmonic functions in adjacent domains, then the quiz quantity is monotone. And this quantity, so this quantity is, uh, if you want to more or less have an idea of what that means, you have, you know, you take a R square with this rho to the n minus two, and it's based some sort like averaging the gradient square. And another R square with this one, and averaging this. So this, this quantity is R square times this, and the other R square times this is like an average of gradient square of u. And so you can, if, so this function is monotone, means that if you go to the origin, it will have a limit. And if the limit is different from zero, that means that the two functions that we are coming together in this fun, that this funny domain was basically a plane asymptotically, and these two functions were linear. And we know from the Veronica words that then these two linear functions have to, uh, to, um, to coincide. And once you have that, then uh, to prove, uh, so you prove uh, that if the, <coughs> You prove two theorems. One is that the free boundary is flat, then it's Lipschitz, and then if it is Lipschitz, it's C1 alpha. And this is an adaptation of an old technique, uh, which is in a series of papers called the Harnack inequality approach to the regularity of free boundaries. And I don't have time to discuss much of that. So thank you very much. <laughs> A couple of questions. Antonio? Yeah. Yeah. Non local terms on the right hand side. I mean, if you put on the right hand side a non local term, would you expect to have something like, I mean, maybe for this switch, this switch, this switch, or something like that? 
also the segregation, but maybe not the gap between them? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Let me say what was the reason, because I thought about that. Um, if you have a gap, I think then you uh, can move the non-local term, would advance the non-local term a little bit. I think that was the reason. But I thought about that, yeah. You, you have a degeneracy there that you, you may shift. Pardon? You, you may shift the solutions. The, the, the fractional the thing, fractional the fraction, right. because the fractional thing, I mean, the, the, gap, the gap you mean is, would be because it's a degeneracy in the Laplacian, uh -huh. right, in the in right. So but then the, 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 the species which is in the other side can move and advance, yeah. Okay, anybody else want to ask a question? As a matter of fact, I would be interested if there is some biological reason for this um, action over a distance for the non-local action. For example, for the ants, is there, what is it, what is the non-local action, the non-local agent between the ants? No, no, that is the ants are the, are the ones who just satisfy the, the second order. Uh, um, but if you have bees that are fighting the ants, then the bees, right, uh, can travel, uh, uh, travel a jump. Mm -hmm. If you are talking, you know, there are these, uh, the one example I found earlier is there are, you know, these uh, seeds that are like a small, uh, that, that the wind carries around every spring. Okay. Certainly in Texas, I probably, mm -hmm. in Argentina too. Mm -hmm. Right, I don't know, we call it panadero because it has a little seed in the middle, and then it has like, uh, what is it? Is it Mexico a name for that? You don't, you don't know, <laughs> okay. That, you know, at some moment, in the, they, the wind carries them around, right? And they go and feed uh, everywhere, you know. And there are many, there are many species like that, that they propagate, uh, where the seeds propagate at a distance. So okay, this, this so this would be a non-local, uh, uh, the non-local part, mm -hmm. right, right. Okay. And so if that uh, interacts with another seed that doesn't travel, this would be too different, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us here. Celebrate. <laughs>